Welcome paleopedologists. Today I want to talk about another stage in the evolution of soils on Earth um, and it had to do with the advent of trees. Last time I talked about the advent of non-vascular plants, that is plants um, without lignin, and, and a little bit about some of the earliest vascular plants, but the effects of plants on land had um, really far-reaching implications for global change with the evolution of trees. Um, we know quite a bit about trees from the fossil record, um, and we also know um, a little bit about um, when um, they, they formed, uh, basically, uh, in the Devonian. Um, first off, let's consider, you know, why trees? Why bother with trees at all? Um, well, um, lots of reasons. Um, plants, of course, are uh, competing for the light. Um, so competition for light is a reason to get big. Um, if you can um, get big, uh, you are able to shade out um, your uh, competitor. Uh, competition for light is um, a very prominent feature of modern uh, plants. Uh, we notice uh, that uh, in many uh, large trees, there's very little growing underneath them uh, because it's just too too dark. And the plants that do grow underneath them have a number of special adaptations like very dissected, diffuse leaves that are capable of harvesting that kind of light. So uh, there would have been strong selection pressure from the competition of um, plants uh, for uh, getting um, bigger. Um, there is also uh, scattering spores. Um, these early spore-bearing plants, um, if they wanted to scatter their spores further, would have um, an advantage um, if they um, became um, taller, because from a greater height, the wind can carry their spores uh, further uh, to colonize uh, new uh, areas. Um, there is herbivory resistance. Um, if you get large and woody, uh, you're less prone uh, to be eaten uh, by millipedes. Millipedes cannot handle wood at all. Uh, millipedes now live largely on partly decomposed plant debris um, or um, material that has a lettuce-like or bean sprout-like uh, consistency. Um, and so by uh, putting the nutritious parts of the plant out on the ends of woody branches, the millipede has to walk all that way out uh, to get a rather small um, reward um, rather than uh, just harvesting material that's close uh, to the ground. Having long branches that are woody and inedible um, would have deterred the depredation of uh, early creatures like, uh, like millipedes. Of course, uh, when wind insects came along, then that whole game was um, reset. And then finally, there's chemical warfare. Our plants produce a lot of toxic chemicals, believe it or not. Um, when we drink a cup of coffee or uh, tea um, or um, THC, um, it's a kind of a mild buzz for us. Um, but uh, these are uh, part of a group of plant materials that are manufactured for the purpose of deterring um, herbivory. Uh, to a small insect, uh, these materials are poisons. Uh, like a psychedelic trip, uh, they inactivate the insect almost uh, completely. And it seems uh, from the fossil record of souls that this chemical warfare, this raining down um, out of the rain on plants below, not only um, stopped um, herbivory, but also um, suppressed the growth of plants underneath the tree. Um, you may have noticed, for example, under western red cedar in particular, but a number of different conifers, uh, very few other kinds of plants uh, can uh, grow because of phenols. There's a rain of phenols, uh, which are part of the manufacturing pathway uh, for wood itself. Um, these phenolic materials, which have a kind of a pine tar-like smell uh, to them, are a disinfectant and also a deterrent to other uh, plants. So. 
um, long before Saddam Hussein, uh, plants have been waging chemical warfare and creating a rather amazing um, group of, of compounds uh, to um, deter herbivory and also other uh, plants. Now, um, the evolution of um, wood was a fairly straightforward matter. Um, the early uh, plant that we talked about, like Coxonia, had tracheids, these elongate cells with lignin, uh, organized into a central bundle that's called a steel. Um, how do we get from that to a towering um, redwood tree? Um, well, it has to do with another biological um, invention. And that biological invention is called the vascular cambium. Uh, the vascular cambium is a set of stem cells. Um, they are um, in a, um, a position just underneath the bark. So here's the bark of a tree. Like so. The vascular cambium um, is a zone of totipotent cells or uh, stem cells uh, which form um, in the sticky part um, of the sap of a tree, uh, like so. Um, and these cells actually produce cells on the inside and on uh, the outside. A tree has invented a system for creating the tissues that it needs as it grows, almost like a skyscraper um, building itself and still maintaining itself as a fully uh, functional um, community. Um, on the inside, it produces tracheids. These tracheids are initially uh, living cells uh, with a nucleus inside their um, lignin bands. Lignin is the component of wood, um, and it's a phenolic uh, biopolymer. Uh, uh, so initially, these are nucleated living cells. Uh, which are forming um, a growth ring, uh, and then um, the cells die and hollow out, and they become water-conducting cells uh, that reach all the way down into the root like a siphon, and then up toward the leaves, uh, bringing water in a siphoning effect from the soil up to the top of a gigantic uh, tree. Uh, these are the xylem cells. On the outside, um, the vascular cambium can produce uh, phloem. Uh, these are cells that are full of sugars um, that are elongate cells. They have companion cells as well as um, a open tube. Uh, they transport um, the sugars down to the root where the root can do its business. And then on the outside, there's a protective uh, row of cells uh, that are plugged um, with corky material. Uh, this is called the phelloderm, um, or in common parlance, it's called um, the bar. Um, this system of um, growing wood on the inside and growing uh, sap um, uh, material, which is sticky and sweet on the outside, and then a bark, um, was invented in the late um, Devonian. Uh, by a, uh, and the, the, the wood that has this morphology in the Lote Devonian um, has a name. Well, it, actually, it's, it's Middle Devonian. Uh, it's called Calixalon, which means beautiful wood in Greek. Um, this a beautiful wood appeared uh, by about the Gavitian. Uh, the trees weren't very big then, about six meters or so uh, tall. Um, but um, this same kind of um, structure of, um, of wood. Um, the leaves of the tree were actually quite small. Um, they were just these individual lobes that I'm drawing here. This is a leaf. 
Um, and uh, these are sporangia. Um, this was originally thought to be a fern, and it was actually given the name Archaeopteris. Not to be confused with Archaeopteryx, um, the first bird. Uh, these are examples of progymnosperms. In the middle Devonian, Calyxalon, large trees which had a very typical uh, method of forming um, secondary wood, uh, pretty similar to that of conifers uh, today. And yet, um, they were spore plants which had a spore uh, kind of a um, uh, kind of a reproductive system. Uh, in the late Devonian, uh, we get another uh, plant uh, called um, Archaeosperma. Uh, which has megaspores uh, in protective coat. This is the first seed plant or um, teredosperm. Another extinct group, teredosperms and progymnosperms, uh, two extinct groups um, which had a woody anatomy, um, a biological invention uh, that had um, really quite uh, profound uh, consequences because um, all of a sudden trees were able to grow tall. Um, they were probably clustered uh, around um, rather dry, well, rather humid areas to, to start with, with this um, spore kind of anatomy. But later when they developed seeds, uh, they could grow in um, more uh, dry climates um, away, from, uh, away from water sources. The consequence of trees was really um, pretty um, remarkable. Uh, the consequence of trees was the invention of a whole bunch of new kinds of uh, soils. Alpha salts, for example. Um, they only go back to the Devonian. This is a major soil order of forest soils that only um, is found uh, back to um, the uh, Devonian. Uh, one of my favorites um, is um, the rosemary paleosol. It's quite a thick one. Um, this is rosemary, named after Rosemary Carl, um, it, which is in the middle Devonian. Uh, at Mount Crean in Antarctica. Uh, and this profile um, had a, um, it was covered in sandstone. Um, it was very silty, um, very clay. Then there was a kind of a, a this, there was a, a, a layer here. Um, uh, there was a layer of calcareous nodules. Uh, there was a thick layer of clay here, and it got a little silty up in here. This is an A, B, T, B, K, C. So this is um, organic plus mineral. This is clay. This is carbonate nodules, so low magnesium calcite. And this is just weathered sediment. Um, this is a remarkable new kind of soil on um, the landscape. Um, it's thick. Um, the profile itself, uh, this is two meters. The profile is about a meter and a half here. Um, it, it, almost almost two meters, uh, two meters thick. Um, this is a soil. Um, which is making a huge difference uh, in the world. Um, it is um, taking carbon dioxide out of um, the atmosphere by the hydrolysis reaction, which is, of course, feldspar plus carbonic acid. The carbonic acid comes from CO2 uh, in the air. 
um, mixing with water. Uh, and then that gives clay uh, plus cations, uh, which are magnesium 2 plus, uh, calcium 2 plus, uh, sodium plus, and potassium plus, um, which um, also feed the plant. So the plant has now got a whole system of tracheids and wood, which is siphoning the water with these dissolved cations up into the plant for its use. Um, the organic content of the soil and the soil respiration of the roots, the roots actually respire, drive up the CO2 content of the soil, which is much greater than the CO2 content of the air. And so they fuel this hydrolysis, this weathering uh, reaction. Um, this weathering reaction is, of course, then uh, pulling carbon dioxide out of uh, the atmosphere. Uh, but it's having other effects as well. It's stabilizing the landscape. Um, these roots are uh, quite um, robust uh, and uh, very difficult uh, for soils, uh, for, for uh, stream erosion, uh, to actually um, dislodge. The first alpha soils uh, go back to the middle uh, Devonian. The first alpha soils, um, these go back to the Pennsylvanian. Um, the Lycans Valley uh, Paleosol, for example, uh, which is in Pennsylvania, uh, is an example. Um, it's a profile that looks very much like this, uh, but of course it doesn't have the BK horizon. Um, and Altasol is even more deeply weathered. So it has very, very um, deeply um, weathered uh, clays, mainly kaolinite, and a very low base status. So it's a soil in which this uh, reaction has gone uh, to extreme. Uh, morphologically, it's very similar. It has this A, B, T, C structure without the B, K, um, a very similar kind of a forested soil. Uh, but this time, uh, of course, it would have um, supported an oligotrophic forest, not a, um, a mesic or fertile or mesophytic kind of a forest of the rosemary um, alpha sol uh, from the middle Devonian of Antarctica. Spodosol. Um, these are uh, found um, in the Mississippian. At a place called Shipping Sodbury. I love that name. Um, in um, England. Um, and they're not too much to look at. But um, they are profiles that have a lot of sand. They have a sandy cover. Um, and there's sand uh, down into the profile itself. Um, and there's a, um, a BS horizon, which is iron cemented. There's an A horizon, which is organic plus mineral. And then there's a C horizon over there, which is just weather. All sandy. With the um, BS, or the spodic horizon, just below um, the level of the active um, roots. Uh, spodosols, like altosols, are um, the sorts of soils uh, that are found um, under oligotrophic vegetation. Vegetation that can handle a very low nutrient status. Uh, the spodosols form largely on quartz sand. Uh, there's hardly any nutrition in the quartz sand. Uh, altosols also are base poor clays. Um, so here we have three uh, soil orders um, that go all the way back uh, to the Paleozoic, starting um, in the um, Devonian. And I don't think it's an accident that altosols and spodosols came later. Maybe we'll find some earlier examples as people keep looking for these things. But I think it took a while for trees to be able to cope with these low nutrient, uh, low nutrient substrates.
And then finally, um, another really kind of remarkable um, uh, new invention um, is the histosol. Um, some of the oldest of these uh, histosols are in uh, the late Devonian. Uh, near Hampshire in West Virginia, in the Hampshire Formation. Um, and histosol, of course, is a soil uh, that has, and this is a buried one now, so we're going to put a sandstone cap on it, um, like so. It's a soil um, that has a um, histic epipedon, which is very coaly, very dark and coaly. Uh, it's only about 20 centimeters thick in this particular case, so this is a meter. Uh, now then there is a, um, a clay zone, like so, with roots, uh, and then there is a pyrite. So this is the O horizon, which is basically peat. This is the A horizon, organic plus mineral. This is a BG horizon, which in this case is pyrite enriched. Uh, pyrite is F-E-S. Uh, and then here we have C, which is weathered material. A histosol uh, is a uh, soil of a woody vegetation. Um, in this case, with so much pyrite um, forming a BG horizon, it was probably a mangrove community near the sea, an intertidal uh, community, e.g. Now, it takes another trick, of course, for plants to be able to get used to the low substrate, the low nutrient condition of um, a peat. Um, these peat swamps are adjusted to a very slow um, rate of uh, subsidence. Um, that is uh, creating a um, enough of a uh, water film so that the plant material that is shed in one part of the year will not decay away by oxidative uh, consumption or just straight up oxidation uh, before the next year comes along. And so this organic matter uh, will accumulate as a peaty, uh, a peaty layer. Uh, for the plant, the plant has to get used to, once again, a very low um, nutrition uh, material, um, which is um, difficult for plants. Um, the PD horizon is also waterlogged through the entire year, um, and plants often have to put on special adaptations like chambered roots in order to deal with that low oxidation state, because remember, the root itself does... Um, uh, respire. It does not photosynthesize. It has to respire in this in this material. Um, they're rather thin, the coals in the late Devonian, but of course by the time we get to the Pennsylvanian and the Permian, um, and ever since basically, uh, coals have been thick and uh, quite um, remarkably um, developed in wetlands throughout, uh, throughout the world. Um, the net effect of the evolution of histosols and these other well-developed soils, of course, is that uh, CO2 uh, in the atmosphere was uh, drawn down very effectively. The CO2 uh, photosynthesized by the plant into organic matter and then buried permanently in coals. That was a really strong carbon dioxide sink. So that the greenhouse atmosphere of the middle Paleozoic was very strongly curtailed by um, the evolution of these various uh, woodland uh, soils. Um, as a result, um, we have, of course, um, glaciation of the permocarboniferous. This was the great glaciation that was um, uh, popularized by um, Dutoit uh, of South Africa, David of uh, uh, New South Wales, Australia, and Medlicott of the Indian Geological Survey, the Great Gondwanan Glaciation. Um, it actually began 
um, in um, southern uh, Brazil, um, and then moved through South Africa, through India, um, and uh, Antarctica, and then eventually Australia uh, by the Permian. It began in the late Devonian, uh, just as uh, the small alpine glaciers, and then became a major ice cap through a good part of the uh, Carboniferous and Permian throughout the, the Gondwanan uh, continents. Um, these trees, this, this invention of new kinds of soils and new forms of carbon sequestration um, really changed the planet. It re-engineered uh, the planet. Another important uh, gas uh, that is created mainly in swamps is nitrogen, dinitrogen, uh, which is a stable pressure building uh, form of nitrogen, which dominates our atmosphere at about 78%. Uh, Probably nitrogen has been quite abundant in our atmosphere for a long, long time, going well back into the Precambrian. Um, and it's produced largely by anaerobic microbes. Um, it may have been produced primarily in the anaerobic soils of um, the uh, Precambrian. Um, however, ever since, um, the main source of dinitrogen now is peaty soils because the bacteria that can produce um, uh, nitrogen and also um, make it available um, in a bioavailable form like ammonia um, are, are primarily uh, creatures of um, primarily bacteria of rather reducing uh, soils. Uh, the other effect of uh, trees of course and of these rather thick clay uh, soils uh, and peats uh, is that we went from uh, braided streams uh, in the uh, Precambrian, um, where the streams had numerous channels, like so, to the classic meandering streams, of a well-vegetated uh, plain, in which you have a point bar growing out and a cut bank. Um, these are um, the sorts of streams that form when you have channel resistance to um, erosion. Without channel resistance uh, to erosion, um, you end up um, with this kind of braided pattern. Um, and uh, we see this braided pattern now in deserts. We also see it in alpine regions where vegetation is thinned out uh, by cold or by aridity. Uh, the meandering pattern is found in the more humid uh, climate uh, soils. Uh, the trees are also, of course, uh, generating um, a reservoir of moisture for themselves. Um, they are altering the wind pattern by their active transpiration. Uh, the advent of trees was a big deal for the earth. Uh, it pretty much uh, changed um, everything. Now, trees um, lasted for um, a long, long uh, time. Um, they um, have, have been very, very uh, successful um, in um, re-engineering our atmosphere. But remember, uh, I talked uh, some time ago about the Proserpina principle. Um, trees. When trees evolved and were newly evolved, um, we had this great drawdown of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this great drawdown that created the ice age of the Permian Carboniferous found through all the Gondwanan uh, countries. But it didn't last forever. It didn't last forever because um, once trees evolved, um, fungi, termites, dinosaurs, and other animals evolved uh, to cut back the growth of the trees. There's a kind of a balance between the animals eating the forests, tree-eating animals, particularly um, early tree-eating cockroaches and then termites, um, and then dinosaurs, which were tree-eating large animals. Um, these uh, curbed this glaciation so that by the late Permian, um, the uh, glaciation had subsided through a good part of its Gondwana extent and retreated largely to alpine glaciers uh, for uh, most of the uh, Mesozoic. It's these really big new biological inventions, uh, like the non-vascular land plants, which created the Hernantian or the late 
Ordovician glaciation, and the trees which created this really extensive uh, Pomo carboniferous uh, glaciation. Now, um, the the pattern of um, of trees uh, ever since um, has not been uh, completely a smooth one. Um, there have been uh, episodes of mass um, disruption of um, of ecosystems, um, particularly at the Permo-Triassic extinction. Uh, it's actually um, this is the greatest extinction um, extinct. Um, in the history of um, our planet, this extinction of about 90% of creatures, uh, both plants and, um, and animals. Um, we're um, sort of narrowing down on what actually caused this. We think it had to do with the Siberian traps. A gigantic and unprecedented large igneous province um, in um, Siberia. Um, which uh, put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, probably about um, 2,000 gigatons of CO2 because the lavas were coming up um, through a rather dramatic um, thickness of coals. Um, they oxidized that, they, they thermally altered that coal to methane breaking it down, cracking it, and then that methane was oxidized to CO2. Uh, this was a greenhouse spike, the greatest of which uh, in the uh, history of the planet, uh, when CO2 went to about 2,500 ppm. We're currently at 416 and climbing. Uh, we should be more like 280 if we had a planet that was like um, the one that um, we had before the Industrial um, Revolution. Um, this was a cosmic accident. These kinds of volcanic eruptions are rare. They occur at very long uh, time intervals, every 100,000 years or so, um, and they have to do uh, with instabilities in the mantle or hotspot uh, tracking or something like that. Um, but um, what we can see uh, from uh, the record of um, paleosols is that paleosols of forests acted like a global thermostat. Um, I've studied this particular extinction in some detail, um, both in Antarctica and in Australia, and it's quite remarkable uh, that we have um, in both places a pretty similar sequence of events uh, for the paleosols at the extinction. Uh, we have these histosols of late Permian age, Um, then there is a, a dramatic breccia, claystone breccia, a soil erosion interval. Um, then some massive channels, and then eventually we start to get some really unusual soils. We start to get ultrasol. Now, this is unusual. Um, because um, the ultrasol uh, is a soil that forms in warm climates. And yet the Sydney Basin was at about 70 degrees south. That means about the same latitude as McMurdo Sound. And the Antarctic uh, sequences that show a very similar um, effect were also about the same uh, latitude. Um, the um, the Permian-Triassic boundary is about here. This is the Triassic. This is uh, the Permian. Um, the whole ecosystem of plants associated with these histosols um, went um, extinct uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, and um, new plants came in uh, from um, the, the south. So we had an atmosphere with 2,500 2, ppm of um, CO2 in it. Uh, the migration of these warm uh, forests to um, southern latitudes uh, would have been a tremendous uh, carbon sink. In fact, simple calculations uh, show 
and also this record itself shows um, that um, the greenhouse spike lasted only about a million years. And in fact, there were four of these spikes um, in the uh, space of just a few, uh, a few million uh, years uh, at the um, at near the Permian uh, Triassic uh, boundary. Um, the whole ecosystem of the swamps disappeared and uh, all new plants evolved. Different animals survived this crisis of uh, respiration with an uh, unbearably hot um, and um, uh, humid um, greenhouse effect. Uh, but soils patch up the damage by migrating. The very, very productive soils migrated south and north um, and uh, draw down that, drew down that CO2 in about a million years or so. Uh, it's an interesting thing uh, to compare with the modern environment. In the modern environment with global warming, we are finding uh, soils are moving north and uh, south uh, from tropical regions, expanding their range as uh, conditions change. And we should encourage that. We should not uproot the spurge laurel and these other uh, tropical plants that want to live in the Willamette Valley because they're just because they're not native. Um, we should encourage them because they will draw down uh, CO2, although uh, perhaps um, not uh, soon enough uh, to um, actually um, save our skins. Uh, what about Cretaceous tertiary extinction? The Cretaceous tertiary extinction is actually uh, pretty, uh, pretty similar, uh, but um, also uh, different. Um, the best place where this is known is in um, the Hell Creek Formation of uh, Montana, um, and in 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 that place, there's actually kind of a remarkable event there. This is the magic layer. Now, before then, um, there were um, these glade alpha soils. Lowland forested soils. After that, um, the, this magic layer, um, there is uh, a bit of coal, then some big channels, and then more coal. Uh, so this is um, tertiary, and this is uh, Cretaceous. The magic layer is quite extraordinary. Um, if we blow that up to look at it, we see that there's a little bit of coal on top. Um, there's a paleosol on the bottom. There's a layer which is pelleted kaolinite. And then there's a smectite. And in that smectite, there is um, iridium and shock quartz. Um, this was one of the discoveries of the Alvarezes. Um, they first found it in Gubbio, Italy in a marine section, but they also found it in Hill Creek. Uh, the smectite layer is the impact layer of a gigantic asteroid um, which landed um, in Yucatan in a crater that is uh, now called uh, Chicxulub. Uh, 200 kilometer diameter uh, crater from a um, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest, um, about 10 kilometers or so um, in uh, diameter. Um, this was another really abrupt uh, perturbation of the um, of the Earth's climate. Uh, we think that um, CO2 levels uh, from the impact um, went up um, around about. Uh, to about 2,000 uh, ppm again. This is why the dinosaurs and so many other creatures 
uh, became um, extinct. But there were other problems too. Uh, this kaolinite layer is very interesting indeed because it is much more deeply weathered than the smectite right on top of it. We think the smectite is the airfall from the impact itself and it contains the iridium from the meteorite and also um, the shocked quartz uh, from the impact uh, site. But this material has been deeply leached with only, within only a few um, hours or even minutes from a very strong pulse of acid rain. This acid rain may have been nitric acid uh, from the shocking of the atmosphere, this great hole that's left as this uh, massive asteroid punctures the atmosphere, or it could be sulfuric acid from the sulfate evaporites that were um, at the site of the Chicxulub crater um, in uh, Yucatan. Um, so we have this acid scalding effect, at least locally around the impact, North America not too far from Chicxulub. Uh, we have um, a, a lights out scenario um, with uh, a dust cloud thrown up by um, the impact. And then we have the browning and burning of forests, which then uh, burn more and create this high uh, CO2 spike once again. Now, um, in this case, of course, the peats came back, the alpha salts came back, the forests came back. Um, within just a million years or so after this big disaster uh, which wiped out about 60% of creatures on earth both on land and in the sea um, things were patched up again uh, by the soil. The soil is the great thermostat that rescues us uh, from a um, series of these catastrophes. Uh, the soil itself, the distribution of the highly carbon sequestering soils is critical uh, for maintaining a balance of planetary habitability. And it can be reset as it was when trees first evolved um, in uh, the Devonian. But then it also um, is caused, created by ecosystems which can migrate to patch up disasters like the Permian Triassic and like um, the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary uh, disaster. Uh, so looking at it from the long term, uh, trees have been um, a blessing. Uh, trees have oxygenated the atmosphere even more uh, for our particular benefit. Uh, they have stabilized um, the landscape. They have given us a lot of wonderful foodstuffs um, and building uh, materials. Uh, and they have patched up after cosmic scale disasters like great asteroids coming in at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and like large eruptions at the Permian Triassic boundary. Um, actually, um, there may have been some impacts at the Permian Triassic, and there was another big flood basalt uh, province in India uh, for the Cretaceous tertiary. So both effects can coincide to create the same kind of disaster. The remarkable thing about Earth is. It recovered from disasters like this. We didn't spin off into a um, irredeemable hothouse like Venus did, or um, an irredeemable ice house uh, like Mars did. Um, Earth was maintained habitable, habitable uh, by its plants and uh, soils. And that'll do for the moment, so thanks for your attention.